Hello, I'm Jesse the Planners, and I'm reminding you to like the video, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell for notifications. How many people brought your Bibles or your iPads or your telephones or whatever you use? Would you go with me today to the book of Matthew, chapter 10, the book of Matthew, chapter 10. Hallelujah. I want to read something I believe you're going to enjoy today. I want to talk about something that a lot of people go through and sometimes never finish. And, uh, uh, and I, I want you to understand this, that the Lord is no respect to person. And, and Matthew chapter 10, verse 1 says, And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sicknesses and all manner of diseases. Do you know that Jesus is the only religious leader that cast out devils? None of them had enough power to make a devil manifest. Think about that. I mean, man, I mean, all these great religious leaders, you know, and you know, they just didn't have enough power to make a demon manifest. But when Jesus showed up, them devils start talking to him, man. My good Lord. Jesus called them unclean, nasty, dirty spirits. My Lord Jesus. Now, the names of the 12 apostles are these, and you know them. I want to get to verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not in the way of the Gentiles, and, in, and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now notice he, he sent them to his own people, and they rejected him. Go to verse, and he, he went through all the persecution they would have, Watch this, uh, and the people that they went to shouldn't have persecuted them. You know, that's brothers and sisters, you know, in the Lord, supposedly. But in verse, 20, uh, verse 22, he said, And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Now, I have experienced that myself because we're in the Gentile age now. You shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth, underline that in your Bible, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. See, when you know the end, the beginning, when you know the end from the beginning, it's a lot easier to walk in this. The title of this message tonight or today is, Enduring may not be easy, but it gets you to the end. How many of y'all want to get to the end? Praise the Lord. Spiritually, physically, and financially. And I've said this many times, you know, who don't want something yesterday? You know, we Americans, boy, we want something yesterday instead of today, you know. And, uh, but, and, but if you endure, I want to talk about that enduring today that I believe is going to help you. Because I've had many opportunities to fail. I just don't take any. Amen. I have a lot of people hate me. But they hate me because they don't know me. Amen. But actually, they hate me because of the Christ that's in me. Amen. They hate, they're jealous and envious because of my possessions. I can't help it if I'm blessed. It ain't my fault. Amen. Thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. I do that every day. That it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. So I don't just focus on the wealth part. I focus my God on the remembering part. You've heard me say that many times. I just enjoy that. And when I remember, I don't have time to get depressed or discouraged or despondent. I'm not moved by what I see. If something bad happens, you know, I just go on. In fact, I'm going to give you one of my points a little earlier. I've learned how to capitalize on bad things. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Lord Jesus. How you can capitalize when Satan try to mess with you. I want to talk about enduring may not be easy, but it gets you to the end. So write this down if you're taking notes. However beautiful one's beginning, nothing matters in human life without a good ending. Let me say it again. However beautiful one's beginning, nothing matters in human life without a good ending. You see, when you understand that this Bible is a book of past, present, and future, a book of two covenants, the old covenant and the new covenant. Jesus is the center of both covenants, one leg in the old, one leg in the new. So it doesn't make no difference how great the, uh, the, 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 the beginning is. What makes it all wonderful is how the good the ending is. Having done all the stand, stand therefore. See, when, and when, see, it's like this. I mean, we start out good, my Lord. You know, when you first got saved, every, boy, you're so happy. But then came, then came the persecution. Then there came the different things like that. And you think, oh, Lord, I'd rather go back to the beginning. No, I'd rather go to the end. So let me say it again. However beautiful one's beginning, 
nothing matters in human life without a good ending. I had a preacher one time, he said, boy, I tell you, they are fighting me like crazy. And I said, man, I said, man let me tell you something. You're going to outlast the devil. You're going to outlast him, man. He gets tired quickly. <laughs> Jesus beat his brains out in the wilderness. The Bible said he left Jesus for a season, that three months. He had to go heal up on him. Jesus beat him up bad, see. And when it was all finished and done, I mean, Jesus' ending was far greater than his beginning. In his beginning was the virgin birth, but in his ending, you came into the knowledge of who he is. He opened up the doors for all of us to come boldly to the throne of grace with a petition and a supplication with thanksgiving. See, so how do I get to the end? Write this down. We must have a steady character. See, if you don't have character, you become a character. We must have a steady character, a staying power. Oh, praise the Lord. And moral power. In other words, you don't have time to sin. Why? Because you're getting to the end. Let me say it again. We must have a steady character, a staying power. I like that. And moral power to bring someone to a good conclusion. I tell people that die in a cancer, if you listen to me, you shall live and not die. I'm going to bring you to a good conclusion. I'm going to get you there if you're willing to believe me. I've been telling this church, I'll get you debt free if you believe with me. And some go like, mm -hmm. well, then stay broke. <laughs> My God, stay struggling. What's the matter with you? I'm trying to get you to a good, a good conclusion. How do I do that? By moral power, by staying power, and by having a good character. And showing you something that works instead of just uh, uh, confessing that something works. You understand what I'm saying? Let me say it again. We must have a steady character a staying power, and moral power to bring someone to a good conclusion. So I tell people, follow me as I follow Christ, just like the Apostle Paul said. I tell people, my God, if you're struggling financially, hang around me. The anointing increase is on me. I'm telling you, hang around me. Get around me, I'm telling you. It's on me. It'll rub on you. Now get, get ready for persecution because old person going to be there too. Mad at you, try to destroy your character, try to destroy your morale, try to destroy your staying power. But you know what? You'll come to a good conclusion. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I don't know if y'all were here. Was it was last year, a couple of years ago, when, uh, right at the end of the visionary conference, I said, God's going to make some millionaires. When you come back next year, you'll be a millionaire. You remember me saying that? Well, then when they came back, they said, Brother Jesse, I said, well, did you become a millionaire? He said, no, I didn't. I became a multi-millionaire in one year's time. <laughs> We got him to a good conclusion, didn't we? Glory to God. Hallelujah. You see, only y'all should have shouted that. Yeah. See, you don't think you can make a million bucks. You don't think, well, my Lord, you know, I just, I just work for a living. So do I. And that's nothing. Let me tell you, God will pay you more than anybody will ever pay you if you are understanding. But you, you got to have some endurance. You got to endure. You see, let me tell you something. When you're enduring and you're telling, and the devil thinks you're enjoying it, he'll quit. Because see, he's always trying to get something to bother you. If you don't pay no attention to what he's trying to bother you, he said, this ain't working. He'll walk off somewhere else. You understand what I'm saying? Let me say it again. Let me go to the first point. I have a beautiful one's beginning. Nothing matters in human life without a good ending. We must have a steady character, a staying power, and moral power to bring someone to a good conclusion. Kathy said this not too long ago, and we went to Bishop uh, Paul Ratke's uh, seniors, funeral, and uh, one of our good friends that's uh, uh, up in uh, North Louisiana, Shreveport, came to the funeral. And I'll never forget, I said, he said, I said, boy, wasn't he something? He said, I always like to go see how good men end. That's how he said that, right, Kathy? How good men finish. It was such a blessing of the Lord. So instead of being sad and despondent and discouraged because this, this bishop, this great man of God, had went home to be with the Lord, we were shouting because he finished good. Amen. Paul said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course, and I kept the faith. I know how to finish good. You see, the whole key to it is the finish line. You understand? See, you, you apply yourself, uh, 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 you know, it, it, whether it's sports or not. You're not running wide open when you first start out. You set a pace. You got to save a little gas in the tank. Then when it comes close to the end, whoa, Jesus, then you pull upon that. So why? So you can end well. Remember, people all remem always remember who ends well. Because whoever ends well wins the race. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Let me say it again. We must have a steady character, a staying power. I have that in my life. A moral power, my Lord. I mean, you know, people say, you don't even think about sinning. Why should I? It's not of my character. 
It's none of my morale. It's not, not part of me. None whatsoever. You know what I'm saying? And that doesn't mean I don't get hit on. Can you believe I'm 72 years old and women still like me? That just don't make a lick of sense to me. I look at myself in the mirror. I say, them women are blind. But they're not looking at my face. They're looking at my wallet. That's what they want. They want that wallet. See what I'm saying? I ain't stupid. But I don't have a wallet. Kathy, my wallet is in Kathy's purse. <laughs> That's why it's all that. Praise the Lord. But I just, I just laugh. I said, devil, that's all you got? You mean to tell me you think I'm going to fall for this? You're just living in a dream world, boy. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the Lord is bringing and has brought me to a good conclusion. Why? Because, see, I know how they endure. Write this down. Our salvation demands our keeping on to solid endings. In other words, your ending has to be solid. Where the seal of success is placed. See, let me say it again. Our salvation, that means, salvation in its fierce term means soundness. Our salvation demands our keeping on to solid endings where the seal of success is placed. See, I'm a success going somewhere to succeed. Are you? Now, the only way you're going to get there if you have solid endings. You know, there's a, there's a statement in prisons, you know, I mean, you know, a lot of time, you know, you're going there, it, it, a lot of time the prisons are run by the convicts. A lot of people don't realize they're behind the wall. And, and when they're trying to give somebody uh, some information, I'm trying to do you a solid, man. I, I, that's the word to use. I'm trying to do you a solid. In other words, I'm trying to get you to the end because they'll kill you in here if you listen to me. He said, they, now he, that person may be in there for life. Her girl, oh man, doesn't make any difference. You see what I'm saying? But he's trying to do you a good solid. Well, the Lord has a good solid for each and every one of you. You see, you got it. You can't forget what you've lost. Why? Because it has to come back seven times. It has to come back seven times. You catch that thief. He's got to return it sevenfold. So I don't believe in losing. I ain't a loser. The oldest loser I know is Satan, and he's still losing. So that's a good solid thing to make him lose. Let me say it again. Oh, Lord, I like this. Our salvation demands our keeping on to solid endings where the seal of success is placed. Now, I've been married to Kathy, my Lord, for 51 years. You know why? We're going to have a good, we have a solid ending. We have a, a seal of approval in our marriage. That doesn't mean we don't argue. We would never argue if she'd listen to me, but, you know, sometimes she just don't want to do that. You know, sometimes she just get up a little aggravated about something. I don't know what it is. And, and usually it's the scale. I tell her to stay away from that dead gum scale. Don't go on that scale. Get away from that scale. Go buy your clothes. Lord, it's just going to depress you if, if you got a pound of water weight. Uh, you didn't gain 35. That's 3,500 calories. You can't gain a pound that quick. That's water. Uh, but if she gets on it, bless God, and it's less, oh, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. I said, stay away from the scale. For God's sake, my Lord. And I, I could tell that she was very quiet this morning because she got on the scale. I thought, oh, God, I got to throw that scale away for God's sake. And if I walk in, I got to smile. What you laughing at me for? Whoa, I ain't laughing at you. I ain't laughing at you. Oh, Jesus, help her, Lord. See, it's the seal of success. It's a good solid end, you see. See, you're enduring. You know, and you, sometimes you just have to go, though, though you walk through it. Then you say, though you stop and build a house, at, you know, in the Death Valley. There are Death Valleys, ladies and gentlemen, in life. You just keep walking through them. Now, I prefer to uh, pass around them, but sometimes you have to walk through them. Why? So you can get to the end. That's what he's telling us. They're going to persecute. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. So I have to think about that when people lie about me all the time. When they lie about me, like, they don't know what I give. They have no idea what I do. They just lie. And I mean, and, and it just begins to pick up. And since now that like we got YouTube and all the other, oh, and people just believe. And it's all lies. Just solid lies. And, you know, and they don't know. Uh, let me just, let me look in the mirror if you want. Uh, look in the camera if you want. I could sue you, sucker. I got enough money to put you in court. Get everything you got. Beat you till you, till you ain't got nothing left. Why? Because I got hungry, greedy lawyers. <laughs> they gravitate toward money. I'm not going to do that. Look at it. 
Now, Kathy might, no, no, I don't know about that. But I, just, I mean, Kathy told one person, hey, we can sue you. And boom, they just took everything off the, off the internet fast. Well, we could. We don't want to do that. We're not interested in that. You see, well, we're interested in you coming to the knowledge of Jesus. See, so we can get you to a good conclusion. I tell people, he said, man, I'm an alcoholic. Well, okay, I can get you to a good conclusion. I can get you where you will hate booze. You will actually hate it. And when you look at it, it'll, it'll turn your stomach and make you sick. You think so? I don't think so. I know so. For I know in whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep what I commit, what I commit to him against that day. So when you understand that, see, that's getting you to what I call a solid ending. When I married Kathy, I made up my mind that this is it. This is going to last forever. Now, you know, I didn't think it'd be 51 years later, but we still act the same. And we're together, what, 20, almost 24 hours a day, not all the time, but most of the time. You know, I'm flying back and forth all the time. So, lately, she's been coming with me. I, I don't know why she's been coming. Why you been coming with me lately? I don't understand that. <laughs> I mean, she says, I'm going with you. I said, oh, okay. And I'm going with you. I said, oh, okay. I mean, I mean, I like her to come, you know. I mean, that's a lot of work. She's the pastor of the church, plus she's the CEO of uh, Jesse the Prime Minister, chief operating officer, all that kind of stuff. But my God, I, I just think she likes hanging around with me. I guess. I don't know what it is. Hallelujah. I try to talk to her in the plane. She says, I'm doing something. Okay. I ain't saying nothing in the plane. <laughs> Hallelujah. Man. Then I just say, would you care for, you want a Diet Coke? You want to, and she, Kathy likes a Diet Coke with potato chips. <laughs> now, how does that work? <laughs> it's like a lady I knew. She said, I'm on a diet. So she was eating donuts and drinking skim milk. <laughs> Some people just need intelligence. Our salvation demands our keeping on the solid endings where the seal of success is placed. Oh, yeah. See, remember this, that you are a success going somewhere to succeed. I've said this so many times, and I'll probably say it again tonight when I'm in Cloverdale, Indiana, and I really mean this, and I want you to understand this. The reason why you're struggling with finances, I've said this so many times, I want to say it a billion times, don't forget. The reason why you don't have enough money because you don't know what you want. You know what you need, and you believed it to the end of the month, then by God, you got to start on day one again, trying to get some need in. But when you have what you want, you don't even think about need. Need's not even a part of your mentality. See, now the Lord has become your shepherd. And a shepherd leads you to what? Green pastures, which means supply, prosperity, blessing. See? But you got to know what you want. And when you know what you want, my God, you'll never have to ever be concerned about a need anywhere. Now write this down. It takes more than a good first chapter to make a worthy and good book. Some people, you ever picked up a book, so I'm going to read and the first chapter was wonderful and the rest of it was trash. You didn't finish it out. It takes more than a good first chapter to make a worthy and good book. You see, most people, you know, I find a lot of them, they have, when they start out, they have a first good chapter but they don't have a good book. I mean, how can preachers commit adultery? Who? That don't make no sense to me. Well, I know Maria Hillman. I never forget someone told me that one time, he, that his preacher said, well, everybody needs a spare tire. Oh. He called a woman a spare tire. Can you believe that? Good. That don't make no sense to me. You see, who you started, Paul said, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? See, they had a good chapter, but they didn't have a good book. He had to straighten them up and straighten them out. You see what I'm saying? You want people to read the whole book. You want to give them something in each chapter that'll take them to the next chapter. And they can design those chapters like part of their lives. Let me say it again. It takes more than a good first chapter to make a worthy and good book. So, and they say, and then they want people, uh, well, you know, they still want people to trust them. Well, how can they trust you once they trusted you before and you broke it or you keep breaking it? Now, divorce happens, ladies and gentlemen. I have enough understanding. I know those things. That's happening. You know what I mean? Now, sometimes things just blow up. I got enough sense to know that. And I've had people say, well, they just have to go back. No, they don't. I mean, I guess it could, they could if they would, if it, but you know, they don't. In other words, everyone has a right to be happy. No, it was you want a happy life, which means that your book should be worthy for people to read. 
So I'm very careful about myself, where I go, what I do, because I know people watch me. And I don't mean that pridefully. I mean, my God, I mean, I can't go nowhere. I mean, somebody knows me. I don't mean that. And sometimes uh, my, my granddaughter calls it being famous. She said, being famous. You know, you're going to catch some trouble. Being I'm, I don't consider myself famous, but everywhere I go, usually someone's going to show up and uh, know me. I've never been to the Kentucky Derby in my life, but I went and I had such a wonderful time. And i never forget, I walked in and people were hollering, hey, Brother Jesse! <laughs> but not one horse said anything to me. <laughs> Because didn't, they didn't come to see me. I came to see them. And I was amazed at how beautiful those horses were. Because those are athletes, boy. Whoo! But I didn't know you don't go empty-handed to a horse. That thoroughbred wants some peppermint. I walked up there to the little boy, and he looked at me. And he was looking for the peppermint. I could tell he's a little irritated. Like, what's, huh, I thought you believed in prosperity. <laughs> he ain't got no peppermints. I didn't know. I, but next time, I'm bringing me some peppermints. You know what I'm saying? Give him a little taste. See what I'm saying? So, I mean, it, it happened Saturday. I, we, me and Kathy decided to go to um, uh, Baton Rouge. So, what's the name of that uh, restaurant you like? J. Alexander. So, we said, we're going to go over there. So, we called Leroy and Carolyn Thompson. I just, I hadn't seen him for about a year. I said, hey, Leroy, what's up, Justin? What's up there, Leroy? We have a wonderful time. Boy, it's a blessing, you know. So, we walked in and we sat down, you know. So, this man comes up to me, a wonderful man. He's a, a Latino man. He's, a, I think, a Spanish pastor for the healing place. He said, I watch you all the time. I just love you. I said, well, thank you. I love you. He's sitting with a producer uh, from Hollywood. And, and so we talked a little bit like that. And, uh, and uh, so I'm waiting because uh, Leroy had to go park the car. And I'm waiting for Leroy to come in. Kathy and Karen already done sat down. So I don't know. You know, I'm just walk, walking around, praise the Lord, you know, just waiting. So and we're talking about this. And he said, you know, I wouldn't mind doing a movie on, on, one of your, uh, on your close encounters. I said, that's not going to happen. I said, they've offered me millions of dollars to do that before. I've had two directors and two Hollywood producers offer me that in Los Angeles. I said, oh, no. I said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to say I won't, but it, most likely I never will. Why? Uh, yeah, well, because the Lord didn't tell me to. See, I'm not moved by money like a lot of people think. I believe in prosperity. I mean, you know, I, I, and I, I, immediately, but it doesn't move me. Do you understand? To me, I find out what is this for? What is the reason for it? What, why do you give me this, God? What do you want me to do with this? You know, whatever. And then, so I'm sitting there, all of a sudden, I hear this, hello there, young man. Well, how you doing? And I turn around, and it's Jimmy Swaggart. I said, hey, Jimmy. He said, Jesse, I love you. He just hugged me. I said, how you doing, man? And Donnie Swag. I said, hello, Donnie. How you doing? They were all sitting around this table. And Francis and all them. And I hadn't seen them in, oh, oh I don't know how, how many, many, many years, you know. And I just, he just looked at me and said, man, you're looking good. I said, well, yeah. I said, well, so are you, Jimmy. I said, I, I, you know, I said, I'm, well, I'm 72 years old, you know. And I, we started talking about it. I said, that sure looks like some good food. I said, you know, I've lost the same 20 pounds at least 100 times. <laughs> oh, at least 100 times. I got, I, I, maybe more. Maybe more. And Donnie said, well, maybe because you got your name on it. I said, I guess I do. I don't know. You know it just keeps coming back. It loves me. It can't help itself. It just, but I said, I, you know, I said, I, I have to fight it and all that kind of stuff. And I said, boy, Jimmy, you looking good. I said, how old are you, Jimmy? He said, I'm 86. I said, I didn't think you were 86. I thought maybe you were 80 or 80. I said, you look good. And he said, well, thank you, man. And we talked about old times. You know, we preached in a lot of the same places, had a lot of the same friends. And this is talking 40 years ago, okay? You know, I've been in the ministry 45 years. I've been preaching 45 years. Make a long story short, we had a great, a great time. We went sitting. I said, this is Leroy. They all, they all knew Leroy, knew, knew me and everything. <laughs> I said, I'm Leroy. I said, boy, just you famous, man. Look at the people. I said, I ain't famous. And all that kind of, but people just watching. And this man come back. Oh, Jesus. Oh, would you sign my book? Yeah, I'll sign your book and stuff like that. I don't mind. Anyway, we're just having a wonderful time. So they were about ready to get up. He taps me on the shoulder again. And it's Jim. He got tears in his eyes. He said, you just don't know how much I love you. Been out there long. And he just hugged me. I said, thank you, Jimmy. Thank you. I, I, you know. Then I realized we have been out there a long time. But the end is not yet. The end is not yet. Now, what are we going to do now? But it was such an honor. It was such a blessing. I mean, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, I, you know, <laughs> you know, I just, I don't have time to be discouraged, despondent, even though sometimes I want to be. I'm just as human. I don't like it when people hate me and say bad things about me. But no matter, you will, you will never offend me. You can give it your best shot. It ain't going to happen. I didn't say you couldn't hurt my feelings, but I won't let it turn to offense. You see what I'm saying? So I just walk in that, see, which brings me to this point. Enduring to the end is not a burden of duty, 
but a gospel of liberty. Write that down. Enduring to the end is not a burden of duty, but a gospel of liberty. Say, whom the Son has set free is free indeed. I'm free. Even those people who speak evil of me get mad. Say, never. But when I see them, I hey, how you doing? I'll buy you dinner. I'll buy you lunch. I mean, don't mean why? Because enduring to me is not a burden of duty. Well, I just got to get through this thing. No, it's a gospel. It's a good news of liberty. See, it, you know, I mean, I've said it so many times. You can't hate me more than I love you. Amen. Do you see my point? You understand? So, you know, it's, it's, it, that does mean I have to endure some things. I'm enduring some things right now because of Hurricane Ida. I'm waiting on, uh, uh, what do you call it, material stuff because things are in short supply. Well, they're not in short supply. They're just offshore. Yeah. I mean, that's where they are. They're in those tankers and all that kind of stuff. And the more they sit out there, the higher it goes up. I, it makes no sense to me that people, you know, we create our own trouble. We create inflation. We create depressions. Why don't you just leave well enough alone? But it's amazing what people will do. So enduring to the end is not a burden of duty, but a gospel of liberty. Yeah, and I wish everybody would love me. I do. But I mean, I know they won't. And, I, you know, and, and they ain't going to agree with everything I say. They should. I know that's sounds cocky and arrogant. I'm not saying what I'm saying. I only say what he says. And I only do what he says to do. See, if you want to be right all the time, because Jesus was right all the time, he said, I only say what my father says and I only do what my father says to do. So let me just say this. Even Mark Twain said, if you always tell the truth, you can forget what you said. Because the truth will set you free. The truth never changes. See, so when I preach this gospel, I only say what he says and I only do what he tells me to do. And if he says, by his stripes, I'm healed. And even though I'm having a problem in my body, I don't deny that. I deny it's right. Jesus says I'm healed. So I'm going to look at my answer stronger than I'm going to look at my, at, my, at my problem. Why? And I'm not enduring through it. I have, a, I have a gospel right to believe in healing. I have a gospel right to be healthy. Let me make somebody mad. I have a gospel right to be wealthy. Why? Because the earth is the Lord, but the, heaven had he given to the, the, heavens, are the heavens are the Lord, but the earth had he given to the children of men. I have a right to that. See, I don't know why people get mad when you, when you declare your rights. Hmm. So enduring to the end is not a burden of duty, but a gospel of liberty. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Write this down. Never break faith with yourself. I want to talk about that for a minute. Never break faith with yourself. How do I do that? Keep your honor bright in your eyes. Never break faith with yourself. Keep your honor bright in your eyes. The Bible says, God said, whoever honors me, I will honor you. This is not my notes, but you can write this down. Honor is a gift the person gives to himself. See, if you want to be honorable, that honor, if somebody ever honors you, it's because you gave the, the gift of honor to yourself. So keep your honor bright in your eyes and never break faith with yourself. What I'm saying is that believe in yourself. So, I mean, people's always telling you what you can't do. Why don't you tell yourself what you can do? Amen. I tell children, I tell people there ain't nothing you can do. I tell little kids, you can be the president of the United States. I don't care if she's a little girl or a little boy. It don't make no difference. You never break faith with yourself. Now, people think that's cockiness and arrogance. No, that's confidence and assurance. I'm very confident in myself. I'm very assured of myself. Now, that, that making somebody mad right now when I say that. Who do you think you are? What I just said. I'm not hiding it. Well, because I refuse to break faith with myself. I refuse to break faith with Kathy. So I keep honor. The reason why I had to tell that guy, the reason why I'm not looking at adults and all that kind of stuff, because I honor her. And I honor myself. I don't break faith with myself. For I know what God said I could do. And it, you, you get ready, people are going to say, who do you think you are? Well, whatever he said. If he says, I am, I am. Amen. If he says, I'll give you a hundredfold, don't get mad at me if I get it. <laughs> Just because I got a generator, why are you mad at me for? People were mad at me because I had a generator doing Ida. But the houses behind me had generators too. Nobody said nothing about them. 
Why you have a generator? So I can see you coming. <laughs> Let me say that again. Never break faith with yourself. Keep your honor bright in your eyes. Look at yourself and say, I am the gift of God. Amen. I am worthy, not because of what I've done, but because of what he's done. Amen. And never walk away from that. You see, people that once believed and walk away, they broke faith with themselves. And by breaking faith with yourself, you break faith with God. You see, they get tired of enduring. You see what I'm saying? Are y'all enjoying this? Yeah. When you understand that, let me say it again. Never break faith with yourself. Keep your honor bright in your eyes. Which brings me to the next point. No person needs to be a failure. Amen. See? I'll finish reading that point in a minute. No person needs to be a failure. I, I, you ever notice some, some, a testimony service is a bunch of failure? Yeah. You ever notice that? Anybody got a good testimony? Oh, brothers, I got, well, I'll tell you what, the devil been beating my brains out all week. Sit your ugly self down. <laughs> you declaring your failure. You declaring he won. And now let me get this whole point. No person needs to be a failure. All they have to do, and this is where I want to talk about this, all they have to do is capitalize on the trouble. Capitalize on the trouble. Satan sends you trouble. You don't have to be a failure. If you accept that you are, capitalize on that trouble. When you look at that trouble. Okay, let me give you a prime example. Because stories always give, helps people to understand what I'm talking about. Capitalizing on that trouble. When I got hit, by ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, Inside Edition, Good Morning America. I was the number one story in the world. I was on the front page of the news in Kazakhstan. I don't even know where that's at. <laughs> because they said I had four jets. Remember all that a few years ago? Oh, I had people call me. You can ask, Bridget, you want to come here and rest and hide? 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 You living in a dream world? No. Now, if I had done something wrong, I wouldn't have hired. I would have just admitted it. No, I said, I ain't going nowhere. And the first thing I thought was, how do I capitalize on this? I'm going to use this bad publicity and turn it into good publicity. <laughs> so I start thinking, and I didn't break faith with myself. And I was looking at my seal of success on me. I said, come on, Inside Edition, because you're going to go outside after a while. <laughs> and I began to think. And I capitalized on it. Not only did I get my plane, I got the money too. Amen. I doubled by capitalizing on the trouble. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. That's good. Just think a little bit, you know. I began to capitalize. Mm, mm. Okay, you got problems with insurance company. Yeah. How do I capitalize on this? How do I make money in the midst of tragedy? How do I get Satan's money? <laughs> you don't even know I got it. Mm, let me say it again. No person needs to be a failure. All they have to do is capitalize on the trouble. That's what Jesus did all the time. Boy, they come at him with this, he would capitalize on it. And more people began to follow him. More people were healed. More people were touched. Capitalize on that. Yeah. Let me show you how in trouble can happen. You're sitting on something called pews. Okay, when I built this edifice, this, 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 they call it a campus. David Softstrand called it a campus. I just called it the church. I got to thinking, you know, he's right, I'm wrong. David was right, I was wrong. It is a campus, I guess, if you think, and all that kind of stuff. So watch this. I ordered these pews. Okay? And uh, this, this is a lot of money here. Pews cost a lot of money. You know, there's a lot of big butts on them. You know what I'm saying? They got to be strong. <laughs> Don't get mad now. No, no, I didn't say your butt was big. I'm just saying, hey, hey I didn't say nothing. Man. <laughs> Lord, look at me. <laughs> no, whoa, whoa. Don't, do, don't, don't challenge me here. In other words, they got to be strong. So I ordered them. All right? I had them all, man. I was ready. And I, I mean, I was paying a high price. Woo! Big money. But you got to do what you got to do. All right. 
I'm about maybe two weeks out before these pews come in. They call me and they say, the pews are ready. Do you want to take them now? And I got to think, well, we're not finished here yet with the floor. And I was about ready. And, and I got another phone call from Bishop T.D. Jakes. I said, excuse me, let me call you back. And so I got him. I said, hey, Bishop. He said, hey, Jesse, how you doing? I said, I'm doing good. Bishop, what can I do for you? He said, Jesse, I got a problem. I said, you got a problem? What's your problem? He said, man, he said, we have been going 90 to nothing to open up this new church. Now, this is many years ago, the one that he built. He said, my pews won't be ready because your pew order is ahead of mine. I said, okay. I said, what can I do for you? He said, would you mind delaying your pews and let them work on mine? Now, he didn't know. They had just called me and had finished, but they, they, had, they had to have a place. Where could I put them? Well, I can't put them in the midst of all kind of dust and everything, you know. And I said, would you like me to do that? I said, would you do it? He said, oh, Jesse, I love you for life. I said, well, you love me for life anyway, <laughs> you know. And then we just laughed and everything. That man's a preaching machine. I, just, I, like, I like, you know, Thomas Dexter Jakes. That's his name, you know. And his son loves me, uh, Thomas De Dexter uh, Jr. He was when he was little. I said, sure. He said, well, they ain't going to believe me. Would you call back the people and tell them, put my order ahead of yours? He said, Jesse, I'm struggling, man. And I, he said, we, we are, and I'm going to tell you, he said, the night that they uh, uh, dedicated the building, there, 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 was, there was like 10 pews left to be put up in the balcony, and they were banging on that. And when the doors opened up, the last screw went down. And, and you know, he's, and so they was able to do it. Now watch this. So I called the people, and I said, now listen. Um, uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes has, uh, he has, he's got a deadline. Yes, yes, we know that. And uh, you mean to tell me you would put his order ahead? I said, well, f for a price. <laughs> Not to Bishop Jakes. I said, think about that. You got two preachers that are known all over the world. I can tell them how good you are. Or. <laughs> I'll let you fill in the blank. <laughs> and he cut the price of my pews 50%. <laughs> Capitalizing on trouble. Amen. Let me say it again. First, I love that other point. Never break faith with yourself. Whew, let me say this point here. No person needs to be a failure. All they have to do is capitalize on the trouble. So when Kathy gets mad at me, I capitalize on the trouble. <laughs> and vice versa. Hey, you know, that's called marriage. It's going to happen. You know what I'm saying? Hey, whatever. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, you're married to a woman 24-7. It's amazing. <laughs> you learn so much things about each other. The other night, I thought I was in a swimming event. We are laying in the bed. I woke up, and there was Kathy, all, both legs up like this. And one leg going like this. And the other leg going like this. And I thought, my God, you know, it's like those, uh, those girls that swim in the thing. And, and I said, what you doing? I stretched my leg. Straight up. I said, okay. And I couldn't get it out of my mind. <laughs> like, she's treading water. Mm -hmm. Then she got up, and I thought, my God, she did it a bunch of times. Them legs should have been stretched out. Then she walked from the bed like this. I thought, good God, woman, you done stretched the legs. Huh? But when she come back, she was walking right. Never seen that before in my life. Or if she gets a hot flash, Lord Jesus. She covers up, son. I mean, you think you got a, a criminal in your bed. Just covered up. Can't see through the sheet. Lord, she got to be, she, she want to be cold. All of a sudden, legs start flailing and flying. And sheets start going one way. And the, and the cover, the, what do you call that thing? That big, thick thing. Uh, uh, yeah, or the comforter. It's going to, and boy, whoa, whoa, bam. And it wakes me up. And Lord Jesus, whoo. Ooh, ooh. And I go, and then here we go. Here we go. And then she's got the gall and the audacity 
in the morning, I come walking in. She goes, did you sleep well? <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, I slept real well, glory to God. I have another couple in here I could tell about, but I'm a, I want to keep friends. <laughs> Which brings me to my next point. When you are loyal to yourself, you have to keep faith with yourself. You have to be loyal to yourself. When you are loyal to yourself, people will follow what you say and what you believe. See, when you're loyal to yourself, people will follow what you say and what you believe. Why? Because they can count on you. Remember, your word it's the most important thing you have because your word is you. Now, if you give your word to someone and you can't make that thing, at least go and tell them, I said, listen, I'm still going to do this, but I can't do it in the time frame that I thought I could. Well, you know, things happen in life. We understand that. So when you're loyal to yourself, people will follow what you say and what you believe. See, everything I'm telling you is what Jesus did. He endured all those things. He never broke faith with himself. He was loyal to himself. He had that seal of success on him. My God. He knew he could bring people to a good conclusion. But he knew his word was, must not be broken. Whew. See, and when you understand that, people will follow you and believe what you say. I have got such a good record of paying people. You know, and I mean, I order some big things. I'm talking a lot of money. I ain't talking about a hundred bucks here. Like when I first started at Cox, remember that when I started television? Uh, I, had to, I didn't have studios then, see? So I went to Cox there in um, Kenner, not Kenner. I guess that'd be Kenner. Kenner or Metairie. And I said, I need to do 21 shows. Now that's about mm, 12,000 a piece to do that. It costs more to do that now. And uh, they said, we heard about you, that you pay your bills. You had to put that money up front. You know, they just let me, they said, no, do you hold, do, when you finish all of them, just send us the check. I did that for I don't know how many years with Cox. I don't know, maybe, what, three years, maybe more. I, I can't remember. And, it, and I love looking at those old films, you know, how we look. We was young, good <laughs> Lord. And, uh, but they trusted me. When I order things, they just trust me. Why? my word. I'm loyal to myself. I won't break faith. And I mean, I order stuff like in cameras. You're talking millions of dollars. These cameras, now, yeah, well, one, two, that's four of them. You, this is a ton of money. And you've heard me, that, right there, that is a ton of money. Just that camera is over a quarter of a million dollars. So I'm walking up to it right now. See, you see, see, they don't know what I'm going to do. They're freaking out over there. See, they took it off right there. Did you see that? They think, see, but I mean, just this lens, this thing right here, this, this is like almost $150,000, $200,000. Just this piece. This here is a quarter of a million dollars. This here is $40,000. This thing right there. Now, this guy is priceless. <laughs> You've heard me do that before. Okay, that's Steve. Oh, I see, see. And I mean, they can pull me in clothes and they can pull me out. Now, watch it. This came from Japan. And they came. And they, they don't do this. So how many do you want? Four. I think four or five. Four or five. How many have we got? One, two. We got them all over the place. Make a long story short. They shipped it all. Without one dollar down. Nothing. They don't do that for churches. Because a lot of churches say, well, you know, we'll pay you when we can. They lie. And they, wanted, and they took me to Ruth Chris Steakhouse to eat. Pay it when you want. That's a lot of money. And I thought, and they said, pay it like you want the rubber do platters. The Japanese. <laughs> so we eaten at that Ruth Chris. They're on, in veterans at that Ruth Chris Steakhouse right there. And I thought, I said, why did y'all do that? Oh, we've heard about you. In Tokyo? Yeah. They said, that man, a lot of ministry, we will not do this. But you just take your time. I said, how about if I pay you right now? They went, what? And I told them, I said, we'll cut the check. Come to my office tomorrow. You have it. You fly home with it. Why? Loyal to myself. Didn't break faith with myself. They had heard all that other stuff. See, no matter what people, 
other people do. Even though you may be thrown in the same pot, your flavor is totally different from the trash that's in that pot. Yeah. See, if a lot of people put you in the same pot and they call the kettle black, like they say, whatever that crazy statement is. I don't know how that works. But see, you, uh, you don't have the same flavor on you. You see? And I was just surprised at that. And they, I said, they said, no, Reverend, we need to ask you a favor. Can we use your name? I said, my name's very expensive. <laughs> well, we'd like to put you on all the, uh, not all of them, I guess a bunch of buses in Tokyo. What do you mean, put me on? Well, they're all video screened. So if you go to Tokyo, <laughs> you'll not be driving. All of a sudden, I'll pass you by. <laughs> Speaking in the Japanese. <laughs> all that's done is help me. Why? Because I said I would do what I said from the very beginning. Well, you know, television people talk to television people. I, they didn't tell me this, but it wouldn't surprise me that Cox stood up for me. You know, it's television stations, you know. Doctors talk to doctors, lawyers talk to lawyers, preachers talk to preachers. Well, these businesses talk to each other, even though they might be competitors. You see what I'm saying? Ooh, so when you're loyal to yourself, people will follow what you say and what you believe. Write this down. A New Testament Christian. A New Testament Christian, and let me see how I say this. I can't even read my own writing here. Carrying on to the finish, uh, going on to the finish, has set his devotion on God. Okay, a New Testament Christian carrying on to the finish has set his devotion on God from which he's willing to live or die. He said, I made up my mind. I'll live this gospel and I'll die this gospel. Amen. Let me say it again. A New Testament Christian, somebody under carrying on to the finish, in other words, you run into the finish, has set his devotion, his or her devotion, on God for which he's willing to live or die. See, when you believe in something, you're willing to give your life for it. And whatever it takes. Now, you may not know that till that test comes. But Paul said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. Peter said, listen, I don't care what you do. Hang me upside down. Crucify me upside down. I ain't quitting. I'm not giving up. I don't care. My last word to God be the glory. Missionaries that have given their lives in the centuries past refused. I mean, my God, when the Bolshevik revolution took over, I mean, and that was atheist. They said, you, you, you have to deny God or we will kill you. Well, shoot us because we will not. And they died. They had what they call the martyr's crown, which is the greatest crown you can ever get in heaven. You ought to do a study on the crowns. Amazing. I mean, it's just amazing. See, you are willing to, to live or die. It doesn't make no difference what it takes because, see, you're going to the finish. When I went to the Kentucky Derby, I learned so many different things. I often wondered and didn't know, because I'm, I'm not a horse person. You know, I don't know much about horses. But I've always loved horses, you know, stuff like that. But anyway, when them horses are running, and they're getting close to that post where the finish line, you can see it in their face. Their nostrils are flared. Now, the ones that are behind are getting hit in the face with mud and everything. They're going. Hey, see, the devil didn't want you to hear that. They don't care. Well, watch it. As soon as they pass that post, you notice that jockey stands up. And he does this. And I thought, why? Why don't he just pull back? Why did they run almost a half a mile? All the way, almost. I mean, they crossed the... Because, and that's what they told me, that horse is that close to dying. A heart attack. Running with everything he's, he or she's got. So what they do when they cross, they hold and they slowly let that heart rate come down a little bit. Then I noticed some of them, they'll, as soon as they, that jockey, the ones that didn't win, they'll throw water on that horse, yeah. trying to cool that horse down. Mm -hmm. Now the one that wins has got to take the hit, man. And they let, and they let him run a little bit, and he or she, they come back like that, and they got to go to the... Uh, you know, winter circle. winter circle and all that kind of stuff. You see them just sweating, boy. 
And I thought, boy, pour water on the horse. But they can't. They got to put all the roses on it. They got to do all that kind of stuff. That horse is thinking, man, look, I don't want a picture right now. Let, let, get, me to, get me to the barn here. So I, Jesus, man, my God. But they're that close to death. And some have died, burst their heart. Why? Well, because they made up their mind. They're going to do everything they can to win because the guy that's driving them or riding them is telling them to win. And I really believe they know when they're losing and when they're winning. I watched that movie, Sea Biscuit. Oh, I love that movie. And boy, he's going to run a, a, a war admiral. Whew, a war admiral was a big horse. Sea Biscuit didn't look like a thoroughbred. He run kind of crazy with his feet. But he didn't know it. He had a heart, buddy, that wouldn't quit. And they told that jockey to do something you don't do. And they took off, neck and neck. And actually, Sea Biscuit broke out faster than wherever. And it dawned on, war, uh, on Sea Biscuit, I'm faster than this big sucker. And Sea Biscuit was leading. And both of them were neck to neck leading. And the owner said, not the owner, the uh, trainer said, pull him up. Oh, no, you know, pull him up. Let Sea Biscuit look him in the eye. So here now, at the end of the war, I'm, he's right here. See, he slowed Sea Biscuit down until they head and head. You've you ever seen a race? It's really amazing to watch. And Sea Biscuit just looking at him. <laughs> you can see Sea Biscuit. You want some of me? <laughs> he just checked him out. Now, War Admiral just running as hard as he can. And a phenomenal horse. That's a phenomenal horse, War Admiral. He's a triple crown winner, for God's sake. And then he sized him up. He said, then turn him loose. And man, Sea Biscuit just blew by him. So he made War Admiral Rear Admiral. Now, that was in the 30s, I think. We're still talking about that. Why? He didn't break faith with himself. He was loyal to himself. He said, I'll live or die, but I'll win this race. And I want you to write this down. Aggressive Christianity is found in persecuting times. Aggressive Christianity is found in persecuting times. Yeah. You got to be aggressive. When I would preach for uh, Mardi Gras, of all the people that would criticize us, it was the church. Me and Frank Bailey, we did the craziest stuff you ever saw doing. At Victory, me and Frank, I mean, we'd get on that street. We had Mitchell. We'd dress him up like Jesus. Pour two bottles of ketchup on his head. <laughs> Put a four by four cross on his, on his shoulder, which is tough, man. That, that thing's heavy. And drag it. Get behind the floats. <laughs> <laughs> and man, people start cussing us, spitting at us. Oh, man. Last me. And, and, uh, and we had to hide our little... Uh, microphone and we had it in a baby stroller <laughs> the speaker and Mitchell said, they, they, Mitchell would say I said keep your head down Mitchell and he said they're going to kill us Jesse they're going to kill me I said no they're not just keep on going and as I would walk by man the people just, oh, and I said you crucified him you killed him your sin killed him and Frank was on the other side yeah, yeah. we just get people going ah <laughs> and there's old Mitchell going, oh, God, they're going to kill us all. They're going to <sighs> That's aggressive Christianity. We were being persecuted. It was fun. Not for Mitchell, but it was fun for us. We shut down massage parlors in Fat City. Preach to your throat, wow. Throw the microphone to Frank, he preached it. Throw it back to me. We just preach it, man. They busted up my van. I had a brand new van. They broke into it. Busted the glass. Stole, my, stole the Bible. But they brought it back. <laughs> they brought the Bible. <laughs> we shut down the massage while preaching the gospel, man. 
And guess who criticized us? The church. Because we didn't bring them in their tent. No, what we did was bring them to the church. That's aggressive Christianity. Aggressive Christianity is found in persecuting times. Well, how do you do that, Brother Jesse? Steadying faith or steady faith. That's it. Here's my last point. Steady faith will always produce steady hope. Long outlooks and wide horizons. Steady faith will always produce steady hope. Long outlooks and wide horizons. We made up our mind that not only would these people get saved on these streets, they would become a part of the church. And they did. You can't get somebody saved on the streets in Mardi Gras, walking up to a man and go, hello, would you like to meet Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life? They're going to spit in your face. You got to get radical just like they did. And get ready. You might get hit. Who knows what's going to happen? But you just keep going. See, that's aggressive Christianity. It's all, it develops in persecuting times. I'll tell you one more story and I'll close. Some of you have heard me say, it's one of the best stories that ever happened to me. Frank Bailey and me, he said, Jesse, there's a girl, she's demon-possessed, and she's at uh, Charity Hospital in the crazy ward. In the crazy ward. I didn't know they had a crazy ward. Yeah, it's insane up there. So we went, me and Frank, man, we just, okay, let's go, let's go pray for her. Her name was Kathy, not my Kathy. Her name was Kathy. <laughs> I have to say it again. I love this story. So we come walking in there, and uh, there was a Methodist chaplain. He said, you can't go on that third floor. You gotta have a, you gotta have a, you gotta have a, a ticket. Why we gotta have a ticket? Well, cause we, we don't know who's crazy and who's not crazy. <laughs> I mean, I mean, so I said, so they gave us a ticket. They each had a ticket. It looked like a little ticket that you go into the movie. You know, it's about this big. He said, don't lose this now. I said, okay. okay. So we walk in. So me and Frank, we go in there. Oh Lord! And there's people actually tied with their hands to their waist. Some, I mean, you know about them. I don't know, those kind of heaters with that look like a, an accordion or something. Some of them were tied to that. And I thought, my God. Just demons. They're just all de- crazy, insane demons. They'll kill you. So the lady presses the button, and the door opens up. It's electronic gate. So we're walking down like that, and they, as I go by, they try to bite you. I will kill you. I mean, I mean wait, there's no way a, a woman can talk like that. That's a demon talking. And there's Frank. Ooh. <laughs> he would spit a little bit. I said, Frank, we're going to have some fun today. Because <laughs> them demons knew we were there. We walk in that room, and there's this little woman. If she weighed 105 pounds, soaking wet, I'm going to say that's a lot, sitting on the um, windowsill. And she just looked at us. We closed the door. And Frank says, okay, get her. <laughs> I said, well, I ain't doing it by myself. You come with me. He said, I'm with you, Jesse. I'm with you. I'm with you. So we start walking. Up. She goes, uh. I said, you think you scared us? Now, I didn't look at Frank. <laughs> Frank was kind of three steps behind me. You know? I said, you think you scared us? Boom, the next thing I know, this woman jumped, I would say, from here, right here on my chest, off that crazy step, boom, in the air, boom, hit me. We're on the floor, rolling. <laughs> she got her hand over, ah, I said, I said, I bind you in Jesus' name. I come again. I mean, I'm just spitting, script in the name, we're rolling on the floor, and that's Frank going, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. I'm rolling, ah, she's just screaming, her hair's in my face. I mean, I'm screaming as loud as she is. In the name of Jesus, man, the chaplain comes in, oh, my God, get security. Get the white guys with the white coats. Ah, we just rolling on the floor, man. I mean, I'm casting that devil out. I mean, I'm just enjoying myself. And that's Frank, in the name, yes, in the name of Jesus. Yeah, I'm just screaming like that. And that guy walks in. He said, can you, can you fix this or do I have to shoot her? I said, you ain't got the, you ain't got the shooter. I mean, and I knew, I said, that's it. Man, and I just, I mean, when I did, I mean, not, this sounds nuts. I'm on top of her now, like this. Ah, she, ah, in the name of Jesus, come out. 
And she go, oh, and all strength, bam. She just. <laughs> I said, the devil gone. <laughs> wait, wait, you don't need to pro- oh, yeah. Everybody, bro. And she just, she went, oh. And I'll never forget what she said. I wanted to say something, but I was so far down. I couldn't. Well, a demon was controlling us. I couldn't talk. I, I, help me. I was screaming, help, but I couldn't get there. She had tried to commit suicide two or three times. I said, I didn't set her free. The Lord set her free. So me and Frank said, let's, Frank said, Philip, let's get a fill with the Holy Ghost. I said, so where we prayed it through to the Holy Ghost? I mean, just that quick. You know. Had tears in her eyes. She sat back up. She don't even remember attacking me because she was totally controlled by that demon. Well, during the process of rolling on the floor, I lost my ticket. <laughs> but I didn't know I lost my ticket. Her name was Kathy. I said, Kathy, we want you to come to Victory. You know where it's at? Uh, I'll find it. Can I bring some friends? I said, yes, you can. Talk and say it, sweet as could be. I said, good. We're going to look for you. I said, I'm going to be preaching that Sunday. Oh, okay, great. All right. We come walking up and knocked on the glass door. Frank shows his ticket. I reach in my pocket like, I said, where's my ticket? He said, I don't know. And as we were walking down, this demon possessed boy, you got to get out, you got to get out, you got to get out. Get out, get out, get out, get out. Now, leave this place, leave this place. Talking just like that. Get out. Just get. Man, that devil wants us off that thing. When the lady presses the button to let Frank out, the door don't work. The electricity don't work. Something happens. She goes, I'm sorry. I said, Frank, we're going to be here a while. Oh, no, no, we need to get out of here. Just. I said, I know. He said, you're going to be here a while because you ain't got a ticket. <laughs> I said, I'm following you, son. <laughs> she said, I can't. And he said, you want out, you want out. The devil come That guy, demon, but you want out, you want out, you want out. I said, yeah, we want out. Okay, get out of the way, get out of the way. Talking just like that. And he sticks his finger like this. And now there's the socket, brother. He sticks his finger in that socket. I mean, he put it in there that day. I saw the fire fly from the socket, you know, the, the electricity. And the door goes, and he said, get out, get out, get out, get out. And I looked at the lady, I said, he told me to get out. <laughs> I'm getting out. And I walked with Frank, that's a true story. But the best part of the story, Sunday morning, Kathy brought 150 people with her. Now, you think, we great men of faith. No, no, what we were, we were loyal to ourselves. We didn't break faith with ourselves. Now, when I'm flipping all over the floor, I'm thinking, God, I'm not fighting this girl. I'm stronger than this girl, but that spirit is stronger than me. I mean, I'm doing everything I can. I mean... She's trying to bite me, and I mean, I'm in my face, and I mean, trying to, but I held off. They just flipping on the floor, and I've done that several times in my ministry. <laughs> and I remember asking God, why do we got these demons all the time? He said, the devil knows when you come in. And that's when he told me, he said, if you notice, Jesus was the only religious leader that cast out devils because he had the power to do so. And then he told me, I give you power over all demons and devils and unclean spirit. That spirit was an unclean spirit. It was enduring it. Now, did I have fun? No, I don't want to do that. I'd like to just preach and say, God bless you. Thanks for coming today. (laughs) Bye-bye. No. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. What kept you, brother? Just a steady faith will always produce steady hope, long outlooks, and wide horizons. I seen that girl 30 years later. I said, Kathy, hey, Brother Jen, how you doing? She said, still going to church, still loving the Lord. I said, that's great. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. Did you enjoy it this morning? This media is copyrighted by Jesse Duplantis Ministries for the private use of our audience. Any other use of this media or of any pictures or accounts without Jesse Duplantis Ministries' consent is strictly prohibited.